Thank you all for logging in to today's webinar. Um, today, Melinda and myself are going to talk about step-by-step um, -step parturition. So we're going to kind of go through the labor process all the way to the point where our kids and lambs should be getting colostrum, and we're going to kind of go through what we should be seeing along that process um, and a success, successful birth or um, sometimes when we might need to step in um, to help our ewes and does um, through the process. So again, like always, if you guys have any questions, put them into the Q&A box and we will probably try and answer them throughout the presentation so that it's um, we still are kind of on those same slides where we might be able to discuss things in more detail. Okay. So the first thing we're obviously going to talk about today is signs of labor. So oh, there we go. So um, leading up to labor in the weeks leading up to that point, um, you'll probably start seeing signs of milk production. Usually this happens about one to three weeks prior to the actual labor. Um, certainly in some breeds, they kind of differ as well as individual animals. So it's kind of that's why we give that one to three week time period because each animal has um, their own individual, you know, lead up to that, that point. The udder and teats often become very tight in the last day, uh, especially in um, our goats. We, that's a pretty good sign. And some people also say that they have like a shiny udder. Um, and I, in these pictures, it doesn't show up as well as I would have liked, um, but you can kind of see that as it gets really tight, and, and they kind of start moving around a lot, it'll kind of get a little shiny, um, kind of to the udder right above the teats as they start to progress. So in the last few days before labor, you'll see that relaxed and swollen vulva, which you can see um, really well here in the top picture of Melinda's U as that's starting to relax. Um, they'll start having some discharge, which is in this bottom picture right here. Um, of my Nubian doe, you can see that that discharge and it should be clear, um, slightly bloody. If you see something that has an amber color or almost brown, that is usually a sign for concern. Um, that means that whatever fetus is inside is probably stressed um, and is releasing any, you know, releasing the um, their fecal matter in the sac and then that's coming out in that discharge. So and if there's too much blood in that discharge, that's another sign of um, something going wrong inside and probably a, also a signal for some help. So that's one thing to point out there. You'll also notice that the stomach um, will kind of drop as, as the lambs and kids get closer to that birth canal, they will kind of drop down um, and not be held so high. And you can see that in this upper right-hand picture of the U, how she kind of has that indent right along her back um, as those uh, lambs have dropped down and are getting in position to um, be pushed out. You'll sometimes notice a change in eating behavior. I've noticed um, sometimes our does will, they'll still be eating and they'll almost be just like licking a lot of stuff and they'll be licking the straw, um, licking at hay, but maybe not eating it quite as much. And that's kind of part of that mothering nesting behavior, um, kind of the start of that. And they also get pretty defensive, um, especially if they kind of pick an area that they're gonna have those babies in. They'll make sure that none of the other um, females come into that area because they don't want those mothers to claim theirs, right? And so they're trying to kind of claim their territory so that they can um, not be interrupted as they progress through labor. You also notice they, they have some discomfort, raised tail and pawing. And so this picture in the bottom of my Bordeaux, that was kind of her discomfort. She was just very post-legged. And as those um, early contractions start to set in, you'll kind of notice they move a little stiffer as they're walking through those contractions. And then you'll notice an increased respiratory rate, especially as they get closer to the end of early labor and get into um, kind of the progressive of those bearing down pushes, um, they'll start to breathe a little harder, obviously, because it's a lot of work. And then increase in vocal, um, in their vocalization as they start talking um, to their belly, and I'm sure people have seen this too, they'll kind of turn and make noises at their stomach, kind of like a, initiating that bonding with the kid or lamb that's about to be born. And then, um, as they get closer and closer, that water bag will start to appear 
And then we kind of move into the next phase of um, babies being born. Let's see if I can get the slides to work for me. So here are a few more pictures of those signs of labor. I'll start over on the left-hand side. So this is one thing um, that we really notice in our goats is their ligaments along their tail head were loosened as they're making um, room for that baby to come through the birth canal. Everything there just kind of loosens up to allow, allow for that, um, that pushing and to move that kid through. We have um, obviously the discharge and you'll notice a lot of these pictures, their tail will be cocked to the side. And that's part of just all of those ligaments and muscles loosening up to allow, um, allow for labor to progress. And so that's another sign that we look for um, in, our, in our goats, that their tail will kind of be flopped over to the side as those ligaments have kind of loosened and they don't have as much control over them. The udder will fill. So if you look at these top two pictures of my red doe in the middle here. Um, on the right hand side was about 24 hours before labor. And then on the left side is, um, I think this was three or four hours before she had her kids. So as you can see that filled in um, and there's more definition in those teats as the milk starts to come down in. Um, and then here on the bottom, this is just more pictures of those bellies kind of dropping in as they get closer to labor. Um, some mucus. And then on the far right hand side is again a picture of a U with her udder filling in as she got closer to labor. Oh, and then we'll show this video. So hopefully you guys are seeing this. This is just kind of that. Um, she these are those early labor contractions. You can kind of see as she's kind of stretching and moving as that stomach kind of contracts and that's just getting her body ready um, to push and have, these are those early labor contractions. And then you'll, as they progress and get closer to the actual birth, they'll have more of those like bearing down contractions. Um, one person says they can't see the video. Melinda, I don't know if you saw that. Um, but these are kind of harder to catch, especially um, certain animals are really good at disguising these type of contractions. But um, they are helpful because this was about an hour, I would say, before she actually gave birth. And so if you can start seeing these, you can keep a closer eye on your animals to um, help them if they need it. Okay, so this is a video that I took last spring. It's in April. Um, this is a first time lambing you. And I just wanted to walk through some of the, um, with the, with the sheep, you can see she's got a very tight bag and her teats are now sticking straight out full. Um, she's got a very relaxed vulva. Obviously the other animals are interested in what's going on and her tail is cocked off to the side. Um, she's also got some indentation where that lamb has dropped down a bit. And she also had some elevated respiration. So these are very classic signs and not every uh, you and doe is going to have the same perfect signs when they are going into labor. But there's um, usually a combination of at least two or three of these things as they're coming into that last 12 hours before um, they start lambing. This particular video was taken, um, I'll play it one more time. This particular video was taken um, an hour before her water dropped. So she's very close. Um, and sometimes at this stage, their udder won't be quite as full, especially those ewes and does that are a little bit older and have had lambs before. Um, but usually you do see a lot of this relaxation in the back end. Um, you'll see the the belly drop, and any obvious signs of discomfort, not coming in for feed, um, going off in the corner for some, I've had use that have done that for an entire week, very little food, spending a lot of time in her nesting site. And um, it's just very variable among animals, but you know they're coming up on it when that starts to happen. Um, so this one is about an hour later. 
she's um, beginning to do some pretty uh, obvious nesting. She's going to get up and down a lot and move around. She's very uncomfortable. She'll start pawing the ground, um, getting that defensive um, behavior going with the other animals. And so this is a sign that you're more than likely within an hour or two of delivery. Um, and this, like I said, is a first time lammer. And so she's um, not really sure what's going on. And sometimes that's helpful, especially when these are the ones that are more than likely going to need um, help at some point. So um, just a couple more seconds of this nesting behavior. So now when she gets up, it's hard to see from the front, but you can see she's got the water bag has dropped. At this point, um, you can expect to see a lamb on the ground if everything goes well within about half an hour. Um, maybe an hour if they're um, first timers or, or things are more difficult. Um, and usually once they've hit that half an hour to hour mark, you can start to watch and see if they're going to need any um, extra assistance. But this is a time frame that you kind of want to let them do their thing um, because most of the time it takes a lot longer than you think it's going to when you're watching. So it's kind of like the watch pot never boils. It's the same sort of scenario uh, when, <laughs> when you're lambing and kidding. So just be patient and um, half an hour seems like a really long time if you're watching that closely. So um, in this video, we start to see those contractions. This is now 340, which is um, 10 minutes after the water bag dropped. So we're on schedule to start seeing some um, progress here in the next 20 minutes. And she is um, at a point now where she's showing some feet. And you can see we're going to discuss this in uh, a little bit, but the feet are pointed in a fashion that tells us it's coming out head first as it should. Now we see that the head has indeed come with it. So now we just have to be patient and um, let her do her thing. So um, there's a lot of up and down. Uh, they're hoping to use some of that um, gravity to help them be able to get that lamb to come sooner. So that's why they're going up and down um, constantly while they're having those lambs. And she's going to um, I'll let you watch for a second. <laughs> So now as she stands up, she dumps him right on his head. And that's um, sometimes a little bit of nerve wracking for, you know, when you see it for the first time, but it's important that these lambs get kind of jarred um, that way, get some kind of coughing and, and moving around so they can get a good start. So, um, at this point, if it's a single lamb, she's done. And now she has to get those lambs or that lamb up and nursing. If she's going to have a second lamb or kid, it's going to be in the next 20 to 30 minutes. In the meantime, you want to see her um, nuzzling the lamb or kid, um, getting him up and going. And hopefully he'll either be almost to the point of nursing or having already gotten a little bit of milk before that next uh, lamb or kid comes. Um, but usually the, the lambs, if everything goes well, in the first 30 minutes to an hour, everything will be fine. They get up, they go nurse. Um, in this particular video, it's April, it's pretty warm. Um, and so you give them a little more time at this point, but if it's cold and miserable and nasty outside, um, you'll see that the lambs and kids will start to uh, weakened. They won't be working as hard to find the milk. Um, at this point, it's probably worth having some intervention a little bit earlier just so that you get that milk in them and get them going um, more quickly. 
So now we'll move into the different ways that lambs and kids can present as they're being born. Um, this one on the left is how they should come in the best case scenario. So feet first, head to follow, and everything happens like it should, no problems. Although there's a lot of other things that can happen. Um, we can have one leg forward and one back, um, bent legs, uh, twisty legs, head back, either underneath or above. They can be coming upside down, which is just not very conducive for this angle of uh, the birth canal. We can have all our legs coming at once or no legs coming. So there's a multitude of ways that uh, this can be kind of messy. And so um, Carmen's gonna talk a little bit about visual uh, presentation in the next slide. But the main thing that you wanna do is identify if you can see feet and what feet are coming. Fronts, backs, are they upside down? Are they um, two of the same right foot, et cetera, because there are times where twin lambs try to come at the same time, or maybe um, in uh, this case, you've got front feet and back feet trying to come at the same time. And so if you can identify without having to catch the you or the doe, um, that's ideal because if she can do it on her own, she should. If you have to go after the lambs, Carmen will talk about some of the other pieces to that. But the main thing is if you, if you go in and you find feet first, you follow the leg back and decide, is this a front shoulder or a hind um, hip? If it's the front, now where is the head? And you can orient the head back around so that it's coming the way that it should. Um, the main thing is, is you want two feet and if the head's coming, make sure the head is presented in a way that it's not trying to pull the head back while you're pulling. Um, you could cause some damage to the lamb or the kid that way. Um, so you wanna, if you can get your head or your hand behind the head and pull with the legs so it comes out the way that it needs to. Um, if you can't, um, if you don't have room to get your hand all the way behind the head, you can hook the teeth and pull that way. It's just really important to make sure that the head comes uh, at the same time as the legs so you're not causing any sort of um, physical damage to the lamb and the kid. Did I cover everything I should have on that, Carmen? Yeah, I think so. Um, the biggest thing if, well, and I guess I can talk about it with assisting, but um, yeah, so I'll talk about it in the next slide. But we had one question on um, how often do your animals need assistance? And I think I will try and address that in the next slide. So I'll wait on that one. Okay. Okay, so the next slide, this is kind of what Melinda is talking about with having the normal uh, feet presentation with those front feet with the toes pointing or the, yeah, I mean, it's the toes, it's the hooves pointing upwards. Um, and then having that nose directly in between the toes. That's, that's the perfect way. Sometimes they're a little crooked. Um, sometimes you may have just one, one leg in the nose. Um, and if you're there to help pull that, that can be pretty successful as long as the kid or lamb isn't too big. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing I'll say, especially with assistance, is to only pull when they're pushing. Uh, don't just keep pulling, pulling, pulling when they're not pushing because you can cause some damage to both um, the lamb or kid as well as your doe or you when you're pulling and just pulling, pulling and, and they're not um, helping with the, pro with the progress. I've had some that have gone into labor and just aren't really having a lot of contractions. Um, and so as long as you're not fighting their natural um, contractions, you can go ahead and pull those kids out. So I have some videos showing that um, pretty, pretty easily in the next slide or two. Um, but that's one thing to keep in mind. If, if they are pushing really hard, your job is to just make sure that that kid doesn't go back in. You at least need to hold it as far as they've pushed it without pulling um, and causing any more damage. So when to assist is when they're straining with no progress. Um, if you've seen them 
in that obvious labor for a couple of hours with no big change, um, it's time to get cleaned up and go in and see what's happening. Um, also, if your ureto becomes tired or weak, and especially um, if there is a problem, if they're presenting with like a hip or the tail, something that's not going to get into that birth canal and start those big contractions, um, that's kind of when it, it's hard because if you don't if you don't see the early labor and you haven't really seen them bear down and push because nothing's in the birth canal yet, it's hard to tell if you should go in. So that's why it's important to keep a close eye on your animals as they get into those last few days of their pregnancy um, to pick up on any of those kind of signals. Um, you can assist, like I said, with one foot and a nose showing and the other foot missing. Um, those, if, if the foot and the nose don't look too big. We usually just pull those. Um, some people would like to push in the foot and nose and grab that second foot. Um, but usually if they've gotten it far enough, you can probably just assist them with helping the rest of it out. And then two right or left feet showing or more than two feet. Usually that means um, your twins are coming simultaneously. And we've experienced that before. And the best thing there is if you can get it all back in and kind of sort out two feet and a nose um, and then work from there. I know that's really nerve wracking because you're wondering if the two feet go to the same body. Um, but for the most part, you are you can kind of tell based on size and if they're close together. Um, and you know, you can, you can feel those feet and kind of feel that they're on the same body and then make sure that you have a head as well. So I think I'll go to the next slide. So if you're gonna have to assist, obviously you'll be catching that animal. Um, you can use kind of these different systems that we talked about in December, or if you just have a halter and you can kind of tie their head up um, onto, a, board, onto a, a panel or a gate or whatever you have. And then um, you can kind of use your own body. Hopefully you're, they're not too much bigger than you um, and you can kind of hold them and be able to put your hand inside. So if you are catching them, make sure that you have washed hands um, and kind of clean the back of the, the animal as well. Usually what we have is we'll have some gloves in our pockets um, and some paper towels. And the best thing is actually to just put all of those into a clean Ziploc bag. And then you can zip that bag shut and have it in your coat pocket or your coveralls, whatever you have. That way, anytime that you maybe have to assist and it might be kind of quick and, oh my gosh, I need to do something. Um, you have it all there and it's sanitary because it's in that Ziploc bag. So um, glove up and apply some lube. That's another thing to just keep on hand during um, our kidding season. We just have little bottles that we'll have with us in case we have to assist. Um, so put the gloves on, have some lube on your hands and then um, make sure to insert, I hope you guys can see my video, but um, you kind of want your fingers to all be together and no sharp fingernails. That's another important thing because you don't want to scratch um, the lining of the vulva, the vagina, or the uterus. You don't want to cause any abrasions to any part of that because that can obviously um, start an infection and cause some damage to the U um, or dough themselves. So when pulling, obviously apply that pressure downwards, like Melinda mentioned, to kind of help. That's kind of the natural curve of the um, lamb or kid. So you just want to kind of pull um, in that downward motion because that's what would naturally happen if you weren't helping anyways, right? They're going to come out and go down. And then make sure that that um, lamb or kid's head is in the right position. I had to help one a couple of weeks ago and I was telling Melinda, I have the feet and its head just kind of had turned back and I'd gotten the feet actually out and then realized, oh my gosh, the head isn't here. And so you kind of have to push it back in and start over. And that's when I had to hold, I just kind of took my thumb um, and held its mouth on top of the feet. And then it all came out smoothly after that. So if you have to assist with one, um, you should usually help with the rest because she's likely too tired to finish. Um, and usually, we've kind of experienced if you're helping with one because it's not in the right position to come out on its own, it's likely the others are going to need some help getting in the right position. 
um, especially if you have multiples triplets or quads in a birth and you're having to help one of them get out. It's usually because the rest of them are all jumbled up and tangled and they can't get um, in the right direction to come out. So I would just plan on um, assisting and then always checking to make sure that everything has been born that was in there. So after the um, lamb or kid comes out, you wanna clean their airways, make sure that they're breathing and then allow the mother to do the rest of it. You wanna let them clean, clean off that birth sac in the afterbirth um, and stimulate that bonding between um, the dam and kid. And also allow them to kind of nurse on their own before assisting, like Melinda um, said, they need to kind of initiate that process for the best bonding to occur. So this is just a short video of um, a normal birth of one of our goats. So you see the legs and the head were right there. Um, and then this is a breach. So both of these um, we assisted because she, that first one, so this was a set of quads and I'll just give you some backstory. That first one, um, we had seen her go into labor and noticed she was pushing, but not with a lot of progression. And that first kid was coming with the tail, like just the tail and its butt was up, up, up in the pelvis. So my husband had to push that in and then pull because, because it was small enough, he just grabbed the hind legs and pulled it breech um, as the first kid that came out. And then that second one was breech. Then the third one was the right way. And the fourth one, I think he just went and grabbed what he needed and pulled it out. And so um, she also, you can see how quickly that happened because she was pretty tired and not pushing a lot. Her contractions weren't super strong at that point. So for the most part, we were able to just go in get everything lined up and then just pull it right out. And we weren't really fighting her contractions. Sometimes, especially with bigger kids that they might get into the canal, but then they can't quite get them out. Um, you'll notice they'll have harder, more um, kind of down pressure contractions that are in those situations. We just kind of hold what, what they have pushed out as far as it, as far as it's gone. And then between contractions, we'll hold, and then when they push, we'll pull until it's all kind of made its way. Okay, Carmen, did you want to address how often your animals need assistance first? And then there's yeah. another question. Yep. So I would say um, with our older does, we watch them really closely because they tend to have triplets or quads. That's just something that we kind of have. And so we watch them pretty closely. And um, so this year we had both of our sets of quads we helped because they couldn't get things lined up. So we would kind of see them start to go into labor and then nothing was happening about an hour after we saw those first um, few contractions. And so usually that would be because, you know, they're breech or they're coming with, um, a hip or a shoulder. And so we have to assist that way. And so I would say in our older does, we help a quarter of the time, a quarter to a third of them need assistance. Um, but I don't know exact numbers on like bigger herds than what we have. And that's mostly because they have multiples and they need help with that. Um, our younger does that kid singles or twins, um, they don't need as much help because usually those line up and they can kind of get them out a little easier. So I would, but I think we still watch them all, but I, I would say about a quarter of the time we're assisting um, the rest of the time they can do it on their own. And then are there differences in breeds about how often they need help? I would say um, in my personal experience, yes, our Nubian does don't need as much help because they don't have as many multiples. They tend to have more twins um, which typically don't need as much help, but they need more help after they're born because um, their kids aren't as vigorous. So they need more help getting them up to nurse. 
And then how long do you wait until you have to decide if a doe or dam needs assistance? We wait about an hour after we see um, active labor. So there's the early labor when they look discomfort, you know, they're discomforted. They have maybe a few little pushes. Um, and then once we kind of start seeing that mucus come out in any, once they lose the mucus plug um, and we start seeing harder contractions, we give them about 45 minutes to an hour like that before we'll go in and see what's happening. And typically they will go and, you know, start actually bearing down and pushing pretty hard in that first hour. Okay, you had another question um, in the chat box. Is the age of the doe for the first freshening important? Is there an age that they will have more difficulty as a first freshener? For example, is a three-year-old safe for first freshening? I would, so the last question is three-year-old safe? Yes, I would think a three-year-old would have met, reached her mature size and be fine to kid and deliver on her own. Um, there's usually an 80 pounds or eight months rule for some breeds. And we stick to about 80 pounds once they hit that 80 to 90 pound mark. Um, they're at about 60% of their mature size. And so at that point we will breed. Um, we don't notice any more assistance in our young ones than our old ones because when they're young, they will typically have less kids. And as long as the kids are not too big, they have less problems when they have fewer kids. Um, as they get older, we tend to have multiples and those are <laughs> it's interesting because um, with larger does, they're okay if they have enough space for those kids to get lined up. I just call it like lined up because they have to get everything in the right order um, to get pushed out. If they're a smaller doe and they have multiples, they tend to need help because they don't have as much capacity in that um, uterus to get things how they should to have, to give birth. Yeah. Um, and on the sheep side, it's somewhat the opposite because sheep typically don't have as many um, offspring. So uh, obviously if, if you have a ewe that's having triplets, there may be issues uh, such that Carmen described. Uh, I would say my most common um, assistance happens with my first time ewes and they usually have a single lamb. And when the lambs are single, they're bigger and the ewes at their first lambing are a bit smaller. They're not their full body size yet usually. And so um, that's, I watch the most closely for my first time ewes, um, but any amount of tangling can happen if there's more than one in any of the of the animals here so yeah that's that's the risk with small ruminants is multiples and too many legs and bodies trying to get out at once so carmen uh, um how do you tell when a you or a doe is finished having lambs so we if i've already reached in i will just go in one more time and make sure there's nothing left um, so I'll just put my hand in past the, um, past the cervix and the birth canal and down in, and I will just kind of, you can, after you've done it a few times, you can feel if there's anything hard, like a, a leg or a body, um, you'll be able to tell, or even if you feel, um, a tight bubble, that's usually another birth sac. And so then I'll search for, um, the legs or the head and see what's left, um, but typically you can go in and you can push on their side. So if you put your, I wonder if you guys can see, if you put your hand in and then you can push on their side where their rumen would be, um, that'll move everything around enough that you can tell if anything's close and you can see if you need to pull anything else out. Um, that's the easiest way if you put your hand in. If you haven't put your hand in, you don't want to do it just to check because you don't want to introduce anything without having to. Um, so then I'll, you can do what's uh, called bumping. You can kind of wrap your arms around their midsection and kind of pull up on their stomach in their rumen. And um, if you feel anything bounce, it's really hard to describe. Um, then you might have another kid 
Also, um, if you just give them some time after that um, placenta comes out, they're usually done. So just watch for that placenta to be pushed out um, and, and they should be done at that point. If, if they don't have the placenta within a few hours, um, then I would check them, especially if you've only had one and they look large. I hope that answers that question. Yep, and if they're having a natural birth, that's the best way to tell um, is that placenta will come out, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you suggest having separate kidding pens or can you have multiple pregnant does in one pen? I suggest having separate kidding pens, um, especially in young does so that they can have that bonding um, and kind of pair up really easy. And it, you, it only has to be for like 24 hours and then they should be bonded. Um, we will kind of have like a close up pin where we'll, if we have like 10 that are due in a couple of days, we'll put them all in a pin together so we can keep an eye on them easier. Um, and then if they have their kids, then we'll take them out of that pin and leave all of the ones that are still pregnant together. But after they've kitted, we remove them so that those pregnant does don't try and steal a baby. Okay, and the last question at this point is, do you change gloves before you go back in after you've been in once before? Um, if they get straw or any type of fecal material on them, we will change them. Um, in that video of my husband, I think he has the same gloves on because all he did was pull one kid out and lay it down. And then um, he pulled the second one out and laid it down. And we usually have towels there to clean their face off, which is a little bit in that picture. Um, and so if there's any poop or anything, you can sometimes clean that off if you have a sanitary towel. And I will say, um, consult with your veterinarians, but if you ever have to go into an animal to assist, you should assume that you're gonna have to give them an antibiotic um, to just guard them from any infections. Um, because when you put your hand in there, you're introducing everything from the outside world in there. Even if you're being sanitary, there's still um, a risk for any introduction of bacteria and other things that they don't need inside their bodies. So. Okay. Okay, so um, at this point, hopefully all of the lambs and kids have come out and are healthy and moving and <laughs> ready to go. And at this point, you go ahead and let those ewes and um, does lick off their lambs and the lambs and kids will be working really hard to find the teat and get some milk. And so at this point, it's pretty clear um, if you have somebody who's kind of weak and, and not doing what he needs to do, um, if they're working hard and, and going after what they need to do, I just let them go. It's at the point where um, one of two things, one would be they uh, slow down their, their search. They don't work as hard to find the milk anymore, uh, whether it's the the you or doe causing the problem or the, the lamb or kid is just struggling to find the milk. Or if they lay down and they're getting weak and cold, um, this is the point where you need to intervene um, immediately. So before they lose all of their energy, you catch the dam. And the first thing you wanna do is strip out that teeth because when using uh, does are lambing, they have a little wax plug at the end of their uh, teeth. And if the lamb or kid has not been able to make contact and begin uh, suckling, that wax plug might still be in there. And so if you just strip that teeth out, put the lamb in place and hopefully the lamb or kid in place and hopefully they will begin to suckle on their own. If that's not successful, there's a point where you have to guide uh, the lamb or kid to the teeth Sometimes you have to even insert the teeth into the mouth. And it does sometimes help at this point if they're still trying to suckle um, to shoot a little bit of milk out of that teeth into their mouth and it'll help them um, help them understand where the milk should be coming from. Um, as far as uh, timing goes, 
It depends a lot to me um, personally on the weather. If it's nice and beautiful outside and the, the lamb and kid are still working hard, it's fine if it takes them up to an hour usually. Um, if it's really cold outside and they're not being very successful in um, getting that first milk, it's important to make sure to intervene. So um, timing matters, but so does the environment that they're in. Um, the very first thing that you need in that first 12 hours is the colostrum, which of course the dam will have if they're suckling off of her. If there's any reason that you have to pull them off of her, there's one of two things that you can do. Um, one would be to milk the dam. The other one would be to provide um, an alternative colostrum, which you can buy um, a colostrum replacer. But it is important for it to be colostrum because it provides some of that antibody protection for the first um, few days of their life. So at the point where the lambs and kids become weak and cold, um, this is where you want to pull out that handy kit that you have, which has for sure a rectal thermometer um, and potentially a stethoscope. So you can identify what the problem is. So before you do all that, the best um, way to be sure that they're not too cold is stick a finger in the mouth. And if the inside of the mouth is still pretty warm and they're still attempting to suckle on your finger, you have a chance of getting them to just get on their mom through guidance and um, physical insertion of the teeth. Um, at the point where they start to become cold in the mouth, um, they're not suckling or they're not even attempting to suckle, this is the time where you need to bring them in and get them warmed up. Um, a rectal temperature at this point is really important because if they are lower than 99.5 degrees Fahrenheit, then they are hypothermic and they will likely not recover if you do not intervene. Um, and so Carmen's going to talk about warming lambs here shortly, but um, this is the point where you may also have to um, tube the lamb to get some warm milk into their bellies and get them going. Um, so the first video I have to show here is the same you that we watched earlier that was lambing. So lamb on the ground, she says, what the heck is that? Because she's, again, a first time lammer. So she's going to dink around for quite a while. Um, she doesn't know what he is or what to do with him. She likes him, but he's foreign and she doesn't understand. So she's going to dink around, um, knock him down. She'll lick him a little bit, you know, she's just confused. And this is very common in a first time um, kidding or lambing. Um, they just don't know what's going on. So um, as we work through here, all of this screwing around was probably 40 to 50 minutes. And she was playing this game with him the whole time. And sometimes at this point, you have to calm mama down and show her what it is that she needs to do to help that kid. So um, in this case, I tied up her face so she couldn't back away from him and butt him. And we're letting him try to have a chance at nursing. And um, sometimes you get impatient and you help them anyway, just because it takes time to be patient with lambs. But you let her stay tied up until he's got it under control. He knows where the milk is coming from. He's got a little in his belly, extra energy, and he's moving around. At this point, he knows where to look and he's gonna look. And so um, eventually they're gonna get to a point where they understand and everything will be okay. So the key here, I think primarily is patience and knowing when to intervene, which is sometimes a little bit arbitrary, I think, um, but the, the main key is to not let them get cold or let them get too weak and before you help them with nursing. And then we have uh, the next video here. This little guy obviously is nursing fine and how you know is they latch on and their little tails start going and they're talking to mom and she's talking back and usually you can tell that things are going fine at that point. Did we have any questions, Carmen, before I moved on? Yes. Um, 
So they had a question about cord dipping. Um, and I don't dip cords, but we do spray them. We spray um, an iodine solution on our cords. Yeah. And we also trim them uh, so they don't get stepped on and pulled or chewed on by the dam. But we trim about an inch below the navel. Sometimes that way it's not too short as well. And yeah, I also do an iodine, um, a dip on my lambs. I don't trim the cord usually. So it's probably more of a preference or an operational mm -hmm. uh, management technique, depending on what you have going on. Um, and just so you guys are all aware, next week, we're going to talk about all of the lamb processing. So we're not going to get into that today, but um, tune in next week and we'll get more in detail on those things. Mm -hmm. And then the second question was how long after birth do the kids typically start nursing? And um, I would say this is kind of, as far as goats go, the, there's a difference between breeds because our boar goats um, will start nursing while their dam is still in labor. Um, I've seen them nurse as quickly as 10 minutes after they're born. Whereas some of our Nubians will take a lot longer and we typically will help them at about 45 minutes to an hour if they still haven't got, got latched. Um, that's kind of when we, when we go in and make sure that they um, have gotten some colostrum. And then how soon after they're born should you iodine them? We usually do it within an hour um, before we don't, the, purpose of the iodine is so that no bacteria gets on that cord um, and can, you know, infect the, the newborn. And so we put it on pretty quick so that nothing um, can, can get in, into their system. Would you agree with that, Melinda? Yeah, I, I don't interfere that quickly with mine because my management isn't probably quite as intensive as yours. Um, but I do try to do it within the first 12 hours. But if I'm helping, um, I will do it right away. Mm -hmm. I just don't want to interfere with mom bonding time if it's a, it's, mm -hmm. it's an easy natural birth, so. Mm -hmm. um, and then a question about what do you trim the cord with? We trim it with sanitized uh, scissors. We just wipe them with a Clorox wipe and then do it. Um, and then... Yeah, and we will post this after the webinar is over. So um, this next slide is about warming kids. So um, sometimes if they are born and they have trouble in those first few days um, and they get, get down or dehydrated, um, they can obviously lose control of their body temperature and aren't able to maintain that temperature. And so the best thing is to um, get them warm as quickly as possible. So this little um, kid that I have in the picture, he was one of those quads and he wasn't very strong. So we had gotten him up to nurse um, pretty frequently and he had gotten a little bit of milk scours. And then after that kind of didn't feel well and scoured and then he didn't get up and drink at all. And so he kind of went the other way. And so what happened is he got um, dehydrated and then he got cold and couldn't maintain his body temperature. So what we do is we usually have um, a heating pad. So in this picture, he's laying on that towel and there's a heating pad under it. So he's not in direct contact with the heating pad where he might um, get burns from that pad. And then we also use um, small space heaters. In Melinda's picture, she had one, um, this little guy fell into a stock tank, I think and got a little chilled. And so she was warming him up with, with hot or warm water, not hot water, but warm water. Um, just to the point where you want their internal temperature to be in that 101 to 104 range. Um, you can also use hair dryers or warming boxes if that's what you have and you have maybe a larger operation where you can, um, you know, afford one of those and use them pretty regularly. Those would be pretty awesome too. Um, but the biggest thing I'll say with warming up lamb and kids is to still monitor their temperature. Um, so I got this, he was at like 97 uh, when we kind of started to warm him up and he went from 97 to 104 in the matter of an hour. Because we also, another thing that you can try is we turn, we put him in our bathroom with the heating pad and everything. Then we turn the shower on high 
And so then it has that warm um, kind of humid air that also helped warm him up really quick. But then he got really warm really quick. And so um, then we turned those things off and I just had the space heater and um, the heating pad and then his temperature dropped again. And I didn't realize that. And so it's important as you're warming them to continue to monitor that temperature, even after they're warmed up, um, go back every hour to 45 minutes and make sure that they're able to maintain their temperature um, before putting them outside. Another uh, important thing, if they are dehydrated and you're gonna tube them with any type of um, electrolytes or colostrum is to make sure that they're at that 100 to 104 degree temperature um, so that when you're tubing them, their body is able to actually utilize what you're tubing them with or if they're able to nurse whatever they're nursing. Okay, so um, like Carmen said, um, colostrum, super important. This is again, one of the primary things that you need to make sure happens in that first 12 hours um, after they're born. And you wanna feed that colostrum at about body temperature, but you do not wanna to get too hot. Um, particularly if you're helping them out because they were unable to nurse or they got cold or whatever it is, you do want it to be body temperature so that you're not chilling them by tubing colostrum that is too cold. But you also don't wanna burn their throat and stomach. So make sure that you don't get above. I usually try to feed it at around hundred degrees um, 104 is fine if you're careful not to go too far, but um, you can do like you do with a human baby, test it against the, the inside of your wrist and make sure it doesn't burn your skin. Um, but definitely having a thermometer to make sure that you're at the right temperature is important as well. Um, I'm gonna pull up a chart um, right now. This is how you wanna feed your um, babies when they're first born, you want to have a good idea of how much they weigh. It's probably going to be within this one to seven pound range um, in most cases, unless they're just big old suckers, but <laughs> they're usually under eight pounds when they're born. Um, and so this is, uh, this chart can be read by looking at the 20% of their body weight. This is the amount of um, milk that you want to give over a 24 hour period. So you divide that out by the number of feedings. In the first 12 hours, it's really important if mom is not feeding that baby or baby can't get up and nurse or whatever the reason is, you want to make sure they're getting fed every two hours because they're tiny, they need the energy. And when they're nursing naturally, they're gonna be nursing every hour and a half to two hours. So make sure that you're giving them enough milk um, without overfeeding them. Um, the other thing that you can do with newborn babies, whether they need help or not need help, is to give them some kind of probiotic that's specific for uh, sheep and goats. Um, there's been a number of different kinds that I've used. This just helps get that gut going, um, and you can just provide it to them um, at whatever the rate is that the directions say. Um, any critter that's having a bit of a rough start, it never hurts to give them some kind of an energy drench, which is uh, glucose and some other things, um, just to get them going on that early energy. And um, it's very digestible, so it gets into their system quickly and can help them get going. And vitamin B is also good for help helping them get boosted. The nice thing about these two things um, you can give it as directed on the bottle, but it's also something that it's not going to hurt them, even if it doesn't help them, if that makes sense. The other thing is, and this is typically not something that you see in the first 12 hours. However, it does start from management in the first 12 hours. Make sure that if they're um, eating off of mom, that they're getting enough because um, starvation is one of the number one reasons that lambs and kids will die. Um, so it's, it's important to know that the dam has enough milk and that the lambs and kids are getting the milk. So the way that you can do that is um, start by just watching after they've fed. You should usually be able to see that their belly is looking a little fuller. 
um, if they're kind of gaunt between the hip and the rib, um, they're probably not getting enough milk. The other thing is, is if you weigh uh, the lammer kid every day, they should be gaining if they are um, getting enough milk. And if they're not gaining, then they need supplemented. So those are kind of the rules of thumb there. Um, so it starts at the first 12 hours, although you're not going to see any physical signs of it for probably at least a few days. Um, any questions, Carmen? Yep, we have one question. They asked them, how long will you be, or long? how long can you be helping them or have them away before they can't go back to the U? Okay, so that's a good question. Um, if you have to pull a lamb or a kid because they're cold or weak or whatever the reason, um, if the dam does have enough milk, get them going, get them warmed up, put them back with mama, and hopefully, um, in most cases, everything will work out fine. The real reason that you had to intervene at that point was because um, they either got too weak or cold to be able to try to nurse or um, whatever, for whatever reason. A lot of times when I put them back, I will um, spend the time to make sure that the lamb has learned how to suckle before I just let him go without any sort of other intervention. But the sooner they can get back on the mother, the better. And so um, sometimes you might feed them for a day or two because mom may not have come into milk or whatever it is. But even if that's the case, I often will try to have the mother take care of the lamb or the kid because it's, it's still that good bonding practice even if they're not able to suckle for some reason. Um, so even if I have a bum lamb, because the mom didn't have milk or whatever it is, I still let her raise the lamb. I just feed him. So um, as much time as they can get with mom, the better. Yeah, I would agree with that. The only reason I remove them is if they can't hold their body temperature um, and then we will keep them, you know, in the house or whatever until they're warm enough or in a warming box. Um, and if we're bottle feeding or have to feed colostrum because for some reason the dam doesn't have enough or, um, you know, is taking time to come into their milk, we'll still leave them with her and just go out and supplement until she has enough to feed them. But after probably two days of not seeing that baby, they probably won't take them back. Um, so I guess after two days, you're going to end up with a bottle, bottle kid or lamb. Um, Okay, so tubing. So when you're tubing, usually tubing can be a um, very useful tool if it requires, but I would not tube just to go do it. Um, there's certainly amount, a certain amount of risk when you're tubing animals because you have the trachea or the esophagus. And if you put that tube down the trachea and fill their lungs with electrolytes or milk, um, they will not survive that. And so you have to be very judicial with the use of tubing and be comfortable with the practice as well. And so um, we'll go over this briefly, but hopefully one day we can actually have in-person classes again, and this will be something that we would be teaching um, in that. So when you're tubing, you're going to need a 60 cc syringe and a, an esophageal tube. So down here in this bottom picture, uh, this red tube is that esophageal tube and then the 60 cc syringe. That needs to be warm, uh, sterile, and wet. And those are very important because as you're putting this into the lamb or kid, um, you don't want, it's gonna feel foreign to them, certainly, but the less foreign you can make it feel, the better. Um, and it also kind of depends on the state of your kid or lamb. If they're very lethargic um, and really not doing well, it's not gonna be as much of a battle to get that in as if they're still pretty widely um, and moving around. And so that's just important to make sure it's warm, sterile and wet. So you're gonna insert that slowly over the tongue. Um, you'll kind of hold the um, kid or lamb kind of almost like up in your arm and kind of start guiding that down their throat. And so it's important um, before you start that process 
to measure that esoph esophageal tube um, against their body. And so one of the tips that I like to use is I will kind of wind that up um, along their neck. I hope you guys can see my cursor. So I'll line the tube up on the outside of their body along their neck and about to where it should be reaching their stomach. And if you feel like Melinda said between the hips and those um, ribs, you can kind of feel where the stomach should be. And so I'll line it up along that line and then I'll make a black mark on that red tube. Um, and then that's where I will stop as it goes into their, into their stomach. And so I'll make that mark and then I'll um, get the tube a little wet. Usually I'll dip it in whatever it is that I'm gonna be putting into the, into the kid and use that as the lubrication. So you insert that slowly over the tongue and then put your fingers on the neck of the kid and you can start feeling that once it gets into the esophagus. And then you're gonna feel that as it goes down into the esophagus, allowing them time to kind of have that swallowing reflex, um, you know, so it doesn't feel so foreign to them, hopefully. And you should feel as it goes down um, and it would not be able to feel if it's inserted into the trachea. And then, cause if it goes into the trachea, that's a little more of a rigid um, tube into their lungs than the esophagus. So that's another key point there. Once it is in the stomach, you can put your ear on the end of that red tube and listen for a gurgling noise. Um, you can, it'd almost sound like, um, well, it sounds like, I mean, this sounds weird, but it sounds like there's milk in like a, in a bottle or something, because hopefully there is some fluid still in that stomach um, and you should be able to listen for that. If you hear more of like a breathing or breaths, that would be signs that you're in the lungs and you need to take it out and try again. Um, and also you can kind of smell the end of that tube. And if it smells more like, um, like milk or like almost like yogurt or something like it, it'll have a different smell from the lungs than it would from the stomach. Um, and make sure you can't really insert it too far but you can keep, you can insert it not far enough. So that's why having that mark to make sure that you've gotten it all the way in is important. And then check the placement with um, Melinda so that you can put your wet finger on the end of that. And if it's in the trachea, you'll kind of feel um, what would be a breath on your finger. So that's another trick to make sure that you have it in the stomach and not the lungs. And then once you are certain that you have inserted it into the stomach, um, you can attach that 60 cc syringe with um, whatever it is that you're trying to tube them with onto the end and then slowly squeeze that in um, into their stomach. And you'll really, you'll also feel that stomach inflate, especially if they um, are pretty gant, you'll feel that kind of start to fill as you put, if it's electrolyte water or um, colostrum or milk, you'll, you'll feel that fill in. Then um, when you're ready to pull it out, you'll remove the syringe. And then I like to pinch off the end of that esophageal tube so that um, you have nothing kind of being sucked up or pushed down. And then you'll just kind of slowly pull that out of their esophagus. And if all goes well, they'll be fine. If you got it into the lungs, you'll know pretty quickly. So, um, which is for unfortunate, but, um, it does sometimes happen. Um, so you have one question, Carmen, would you pull fluid out to check for placement? Do a gastric I, pH check. Um, I think I understand that question and I would not. I have not heard of people doing that. And um, in my experience, I've not done that with calves or kids. So the biggest thing is I just listen and I really try and feel that go through the esophagus. Cause if you have your finger on the neck and you're inserting that tube and they're not moving too much, you, you can feel it as soon as it hits the esophagus, it'll kind of, you'll feel that little, um, that bump as it goes through their, through their neck into their body. So that's what I would use instead of a fluid check. 
Yeah, I agree with that. Um, one of the main things about that is that, I mean, I guess it's something you could do. It's, I think for me, it's, it's going to be a little futile sometimes because a lot of times when you're tubing a lamb or a kid, it's because they haven't had anything to eat. And so there's probably nothing in there to pull for one. Um, but it is, it is something that you could do if that was something that would make you feel more comfortable. But again, I also would not recommend that as an option either. So, um, that's what we do to check for placement in human infants. Yeah. I didn't know that. <laughs> so thank you for sharing. Interesting. <laughs> Okay, then we have uh, one question. Should you tube them with the electrolytes or colostrum first? Oh, this is a good question. Um, if you if they are dehydrated, I tube them with electrolytes first. Um, because if they're dehydrated, they need to be hydrated before their body will use the colostrum. And so in that picture with the little guy with um, the thermometer, I was giving him colostrums with the tube or not colostrum, uh, electrolytes with the tube because he was so dehydrated. I knew if I didn't get him hydrated, the colostrum would be futile. So um, yeah, if, if they are hydrated and they're just not getting that colostrum from the dam, you can just tube them with the colostrum and not, or they're having trouble suckling and they're just not learning how to nurse, definitely just give them the colostrum first. That way they don't get dehydrated. Yeah, I agree. In the first 12 hours, I think colostrum is the most important. Mm -hmm. uh, but certainly as they get a little older, um, electrolytes will help keep them going. Um, especially when they're dehydrated or they have scours or whatever. So um, this question, it's interesting. I thought about including some slides on this. Um, and we may next week, tricks for use rejecting lambs. I think we probably will now that we've had a question about it. Um, but just briefly, when I have a ewe that's being kind of a terrid about taking her babies, you can tie her up and let those babies nurse. And if she's being really complacent, you can tie a leg back. And so she can't kick them or be a jerk. And this is probably one of the greatest measures in patients that I've ever had to um, <laughs> endure. A lot of times if, whether you're grafting or trying to make a you take her own baby, the key is getting her milk into that baby mm -hmm. because then the lamb or the kid will start smelling like her and she'll have more of an interest in taking them once they have that smell to them. And additionally, even if she never actually takes them as a baby, if you're patient enough and you spend days making her let them suckle, um, she will probably still be willing to feed them in the future, even if she doesn't mother them. So uh -huh. um, I would say that's just 100% patience. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I would say the same. We've had a few, especially with triplets where they'll reject one. Um, and sometimes with triplets, I won't make them take that third one. I'll just find someone else that wants it, <laughs> whether that's a person or another goat. Um, that's kind of what we do. But grafting, um, if, if you have a situation where one has been rejected and you have someone that, another one that will graft, um, we can, that's probably a long topic too on grafting. But it's the same principle. You want them to smell like like the dough, they need to um, consume some of their colostrum and some of their milk and get the, the um, all of the same smells as what the dough is gonna recognize as her own. Um, so we had a couple questions. First question says, how do you sterilize your tubes and syringes? Um, I use hot, hot soapy water um, and I will get the hottest water I can and kind of soak them in that hot water for a couple minutes um, and then use soap, hot water. I don't scrub them a lot because I don't want to, um, like with plastics, I don't want to scrape them at all. Um, but yeah, hot, hot water and then leave them to air dry. Yep. 
And I do the same with the tube, um, just because of the nature of it. You could also um, disinfect with the betadine or um, even a bleach if you let it sit and then re-rinse it. I always use a brand new syringe just because mm -hmm. odds are a lot lower if you do that of any sort of bacteria getting in. So mm -hmm. it's up to you and your spending budget and how often you have to do it. But I probably mm -hmm. maybe will only do it once or twice a year. So I just use a new syringe each time. Yeah, yep, same here. Um, where do you get electrolytes? I, I get them at the farm store. Um, just get something that's a goat or um, lamb brand. That way it's uh, meeting the requirements of your animals. There's a good, um, I think it's Mana Pro brand that I use this year. And it's a goat electrolyte. Um, and then do you ever feed with a syringe if they won't suckle on the bottle or go straight to tubing? I've found if they will not suckle on a bottle, feeding with a syringe is kind of futile because it just goes all over their mouth and they don't actually swallow. So I would go from, from the bottle to tubing. Yeah, if they're at a place where they won't suckle, tubing is um, more than likely the next step. If they are attempting to suckle, but they're not working out the bottle, that's just another test of patience, I think, because um, it, I mean, you can work their mouth so that it starts kind of coming out of the bottle um, to teach them how to suckle if they're not doing that. I don't know that um, with the syringe, you, you probably, if they will swallow, you could get the milk in that way, but you're not really teaching them to suckle. And so if they still have the energy to try to eat and suckle and swallow and all of that, um, I think at that point, it's, it's just a matter of trying to teach them how to do what they need to do. So the tubing is more when they get to a point where they won't try or they can't or whatever. Yep. So I think that looks like all the questions. Our email addresses are up. Feel free to email us with any questions that you have. We try to get back to people pretty quickly. Um, also, you can send us a message at our Facebook page or whatever it may be. Um, we're here to help in any way that we can. And um, we really appreciate you guys signing on for the live uh, webinar. And next week, again, we're going to talk about um, processing lambs and kind of the life of a lamb that, uh, after it's born. And um, we probably will, now that we've had the question, touch a little deeper on how to work with stubborn ewes and grafting and that type of thing. Um, and then um, just so you guys are aware, we probably are not gonna talk about orphan lambs too much next week because we have uh, Brett Taylor from the Sheep Experiment Station coming back on with us the following week to discuss specifics on orphan lambs. So we look forward to having you guys back and um, we'll see you next week. <laughs>